For the first pick in the second round, the Seattle Seahawks select Derek Hall, an edge out of Auburn. And another pick that has many Seahawks fans a little bit surprised, caught off guard. Not many were expecting the Hawks to go after Hall, and many fans at the time were really clamoring with this first second round pick, both second round picks, quite frankly, for the Hawks to go back and finally, dear God, address the defensive tackle position. Well, the Seahawks did not do that as we know in this situation, but they did get themselves one hell of a player. Derek Hall is a fun player to watch on film coming out of Auburn. With all the players in this given draft, I tried to find kind of a patented move that I could apply to them. With a the receiver, it could be their route running. With a quarterback, it could be arm strength. Well, with Derek Hall, when I wrote on my notes, I put Hulk hands. And uh, what I mean by that is this guy's got some tremendous power in his game. He's got the initial punch that he can deliver that's really going to drop back those tackles in a way where you're going to see them rocked. He's got the ability to sustain with that strength and really walk you back in that pocket towards the quarterback. It is at the forefront of his game, and it is one that I think is going to translate to the next level, where you're going to still feel that power at the next level, maybe not to the dominant degree that he was able to lean on it there at Alabama to the tune of having, I believe, the third most amount of pressures in the SEC, of course, which is the toughest conference in the land so right out the gate he gives you that i also think even though he wasn't highly rated by pff last year as a run defender that he is a good run defender and a lot of what will make him a good run defender at the next level is that ability to hunker down and hold up at the point of attack because he's just going to be stronger than that other tackle across from him he's just going to be purely longer than that other tackle across from him so now you have the potential going forward into next season to where you can have this guy at least as an early down run defender setting the edge on one side Boye Mafe setting the edge on the other, and then maybe you have Daryl Taylor and uh, uh, Uchenna Nuosu, of course, then coming in off the bench as that force then is kind of backup rotational guys that can come in in more passing situations. Not that Uchenna is bad necessarily in the run, but then you can kind of preserve him from a snap basis, get more into rotation, which hopefully can keep these guys fresher. But in both Boye and Derek Hall here, I think you have two guys that can be the pillars on the outside and setting that edge. Now, I know many of you have, have worries about the defensive tackle position, and we'll just have to see where that goes forward beyond that. But we would at least have that strength on the outside as it concerns stopping the run. He also brings a quite a bit as a pass rusher. I mentioned that amount of pressures that he had last year operating within that SEC conference. But he also does so from a standpoint that is not just Purely power is a one trick kind of thing that he's operating for, one note that he's pulling on, so to speak. He does three things that he sort of combines together in his attack and he mixes it up like a pitcher that's got three pitches. I really like this because then he already understands a way of setting these tackles up in a manner to call in the proper pitch to catch that tackle off guard. The first pitch or the first move that he's got in his bag is just the straight raw power. He's gonna give you that bull rush right up into your chest He's going to forklift you up off the ground and he's going to put you on your heels to begin the snap where you're always in recovery mode before because of it. You're not going to be stronger. You're not going to be longer than him. Now you got to recover. How are you going to recover? In a lot of ways, that's where that sustained power comes in where you got the tackles trying to reroute down and he's just walking them back and there's nothing they can do about it. It's a slow death. He goes to the next counter move with a single long arm bull rush. And what he's attempting to do with this is attack the outside shoulder of the tackle, lock that long arm in, and then be able to, rather than the bull rush where he's walking him back, he's sliding around that tackle on the outside shoulder, displacing his hips around that tackle to then get the direct line of sight pathway to the quarterback, draw the pressure, get the sack, whichever it may be. So then he's able to counter back to that. He calls upon the long arm when he gets the tackles to root down in pass protection and they do the heavy root job, right? Where they drop those roots deep. Why? Because they're so worried about his power. You know, the way that you have to deal with power at the pro at the at this level is if I've got a guy that's going to be stronger than me, then I mean I need to torque myself up at, you know in my past set that much stronger to be able to deal with that blow. And so he counts on that tackle doing that and then goes to that long arm, which kind of gives him that, that little bit gentler path around the bend, so to speak, to have that pathway to the quarterback. But then once he gets the tackle to start to go, oh, he's going to this long arm now, then he goes to his final counter, which is a hard jab step to the outside where he sells that long arm bull rush. And then he jab steps back inside, oftentimes having a French door wide open path to the quarterback 
because he's just set that move up so well. And he can call upon those three moves consistently to really put tackles in a pickle. And that's where those high amount of pressure rates come from with them at the college level. And I do believe that it will translate. So you're getting a guy to me that gives you a, a full skill set from the position. He's going to be a much better run defender than Daryl Taylor is. I think he's got a better overall upside as a player than what Daryl Taylor gave you. He gives you a great guy in this rotation, fills out a pass rush that over the last few years, the Seahawks year after year have just kind of done just enough as it concerns their pass rush. And now, at least as far as the edges go, we can talk about the defensive tackle position later. But as far as the edges go, they're at least dealing with that position and making it a priority, which is really good to see. And some of you may be thinking that we were already set there at the position because we had Tyreek Smith and Alton Robinson due to be coming back. You already had Uchenna Nubosu, uh, Daryl Taylor, Boye Mafe. So it looks like on the surface of it, at first glance, a kind of a deep crew. But then you got to look a little bit deeper below the surface there. You had Uchenna Nwosu running out with too many snaps last year. It's part of why his grade wasn't better overall as a player last year was he had to play too many snaps. This is why you had to call upon Bruce Irvin at one given point in time during the year. Daryl Taylor's only at this point going to lock into being really a rotational pass rusher. You just don't want him there on early rundowns. That really left you with Boye Mafe as your kind of young developing guy, especially on the back of Daryl Taylor and Echenna Wosu really only being on one-year deals as we go forward here. So as you're looking towards the future of the position and the edge position, there are no certainties really beyond Boye Mafe at that point. We don't know what we're going to get from Tyreek Smith. We don't know what we're going to get from Alton Robinson. Those guys didn't play last year, and neither has proven to be productive or a part that you can necessarily count on with this team. So there's some intelligence behind this approach as far as where the depth is on top of where I think is what is really driving this decision, which is value. All of these picks in this draft, all four of them up until this point, in my opinion, have that theme in common. In prior years, you could see the theme that was need, that was John Schneider and the front office stretching for players to fill those needs. This year, it does feel like they are just purely trusting their boards. And I'm going to give the support of that and love that they're doing that and think that whether or not that brings the immediate returns, in the long term, you're going to see those ret those returns. You're going to have a fuller team, a more talented team, a better team that's going to be longer sustained because of it. So in a lot of ways, in my opinion, they're sort of changing their ways of what they've done to arrive at this spot. And as I said yesterday about this, the difference really being this year in this draft is that they're operating from the same place they operated in last year from their standpoint of their methodology and their approach. The difference is last year, it was the beautiful, perfect marrying of need and value. This year, you've got the value coming in. It's just not quite clicking up to the need. But at the end of the day, they're trusting their board, looking at it and saying, who's the number one player we have up on the board? That's the guy, let's go for him. May not have been your number one player, but I think it is their number one player. I can see how they arrive at that. And I am gonna trust in that process because I think it's gonna bear out ultimately the best team. My name is Brandon Kane. This is the Hawks Nest. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe. But beyond all that, don't you ever forget. Go Hawks.